and gentlemen, welcome back to the Get It Podcast, where we get it every day. My name is Roy, and I'm one of your wonderful co-hosts, so why don't we introduce you to your others? Let's start with you, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Awesome. Uh, hello, everyone. It's Ryan. I have a little cold today, so bear with me, but I'm um, happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's Chad. I'm sharing a mic with Ryan, so I'll have a little cold tomorrow, <laughs> but I'm happy to be with you today. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, everybody? This is Bianca. It's so good to be here. I'm really excited to talk about um, the things we're going to talk about today. So stay tuned. All right. So first things first, for today's episode, we're going to do things a little bit different. After we interview one of our first guests, Diamond Mason, we're going to be talking more about gun control and gun laws in the U.S. So stay tuned for that. It is sure to get dicey. So why don't we introduce our first guest? Diamond Mason is an executive assistant by day, poet by night, who likes good books, belly laughs, and spinning in circles excitedly. Since they started slamming in 2011, Diamond has earned spots on the local national teams for the last seven consecutive years, including three Grand Slam championships in 2016, 2018, and 2019. They have touched stages from the Bay Area to the East Coast, even as far as Biscayne, Sydney, Australia, and they hope to continue their pursuit of knowledge through poetry for as long as possible. Diamond Mason, welcome to the show. Hi. <laughs> Yeah, I know, wasn't it? That sounded fucking badass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. <laughs> You're going to have to tell us more about that. First of all, what is it that you do? Tell the people. Um, I do spoken word and performance poetry, which um, the difference between spoken word and slam is spoken word isn't competitive and slam is. So every Tuesday night, there is a local competition called Poodle Slam that happens at the mix at 10 o'clock. It's a $1 cover for anybody interested. Um, it's three rounds of poetry and it's all original work, no animal acts, no music, no costumes, none of that. Just you, your words, and the microphone. And uh, you get judged by five random audience members and hopefully make it to the third round. And I've been doing that for... Coming up on 10 years, I think a little, wow. about eight years, nine years now. Do you have to roast people? No, I mean, you don't is? have to, but oh. I can. Oh, but you do? Oh, <laughs> I want to. I can. I have the ability. It's not close yeah. any doors here. Now, if you had to roast Chad, what would you do? <laughs> no. <laughs> He's too handsome. Too handsome. <laughs> I got nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> oh, my God. It took you too long to say that. <laughs> okay, so how do you go from doing them locally to being on some kind of national stage? Um, so the competition that happens every Tuesday, the more you slam, the more points you accrue. And at the end of the year, the top 10 poets with the most points compete for the team that will represent San Antonio at whatever national or regional slam is happening that year. Um, so the top 10 poets compete for four to six spots on the team. So if you show up frequently enough, you'll probably accrue enough points to be able to slam at finals. And then it's just a regular slam, but with those top 10 poets and then the, the top four make the team. And then there is the National Poetry Slam, which will be back next year. Uh, it's going to be in Dallas, actually, in 2020. And there's going to be about 70 teams from across the nation that can like, kind of converge on the city of Dallas to compete against each other. Okay. Here's a question that's a little bit specific. Okay. When you go to these events, these big, big poetry slams where there's all people just like you who like to do that poetry stuff, mm -hmm. what does it feel like? Because it must be different than going through a day-to-day -day where... People don't really do that. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. It's like a second family. Um, like you get to know other poets really well. You get to kind of get your your little uh, you have the family you choose as opposed to the family you're born with, right? Uh, and it's uh, just a group of creatives in that type of space, doing what we love to do, competing against each other, having a good time. Um, there's nothing like it in the world. It's it's amazing. I want to know: Is there ever or any piece that you've ever created that took a lot out of you or is the most touching kind of life-changing thing that you've ever written? I have a number of pieces I think that kind of grow with me over time. Um, there is one piece that in particular that I've, I've performed on I think the most amount of stages and that piece has just grown with me and it's meant something different to me every year that I perform it because of something that's happened in my life or something that happens it with like friends or family. Uh, it's just always seems to transform and with, even without changing the words, just the meaning of that piece has grown as I have grown. And uh, it's one of my favorites to perform and it's one of the ones that I'm most known for. Nice. It's a lot of fun. Though. So what has, what is like your inspiration when you're writing your pieces? What, is it just, uh, life and what's happening in that moment or pretty much um it's anything i've written about trees i've written about lovers i've written about good days i've written about family i've written about um just anything that i can think of at that moment and uh it 
it's whatever comes to me, whatever I think of in that moment. Like I'm always jotting down notes or, or taking notes on my phone or something when I think of a line or think of a concept or think of an idea. And I have a never ending list of poems to write that it's just, it never stops. It can be anything. Okay, I'm sorry to cut in here. I know you probably have something, but when you said that you wrote poetry about ex-lovers, give us oh, some tea here. I have to ask you, because I'm going to ask you. Yeah, so when you do it, are Let's you ever uh, direct enough in your poetry that that person can know it's them? And has anybody ever called you out and been like, hey, he's not fucking talking about me? Oh, uh, yeah, recently, actually. <laughs> but it turns out I more. wasn't talking about them, so... It, <laughs> well, well, just tell us the situation. No, just yeah. between friends. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. All right. But outside Ooh. of that situation, no, that's never happened. It's I've never, like, outside of that, I've never been confronted by anybody about like, oh, don't write about me or don't do this. Mm. They, for the most part, if it's like dating a musician, like <laughs> you can't get a song written about you whether it goes good or bad. That's mm -hmm. just kind of what happens. You leave it on the stage. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Now let's bring this thing home. <laughs> so the whole mission of Get and the Get It podcast is to get young people who generally don't care about politics to care about politics. So I want to throw it over to my friend Chad. And Chad, do you have any political questions that you'd like to ask, ask Diamond? Yeah, I. Now is that is that something that like in your because I'm I'm pretty far removed from any sort of like poetry world, but is is politics something that plays into that as far as like in your scope? Oh yeah, very heavily. Um, so current events is something that's written about a lot, especially since it's a competition. Um, since people are trying to get the attention of the audience, people are trying to make sure the judges know what they're talking about. Um, and people just have a lot of stuff to say about a lot that's going on. So poems do have the potential to get very political, very politically driven. And it's three minutes and 10 seconds for the most part where you get that stage to yourself and you get to say what you want to say, what you need to say, how you need to say it. Because half of the time, one person doesn't feel like they can make a difference. Half of the time, one person doesn't feel like they are heard in this massive everybody trying to be heard but when you get that three minutes on stage and you are able to really take advantage of that you can make that difference you can get people to listen you can have your voice heard even if it's just for those few minutes you can say whatever you need to say on whatever topic you need to say it be it politics be it love be it family be it anything but politics definitely does play a heavy role a lot of the time and is the as the sorry man, is, is the idea there to kind of influence the way people are looking at things, or is it more to express yourself? Is there? It depends on the performer. Oh. Everybody has different goals with why they perform, or different reasons why they perform, different goals with what they're performing. Um, so it really depends on the artist. So for you, I'm curious, um, are any of your poems politically driven? And if so, um, what was what was the topic? Uh, recently, I've, I didn't use to write politically driven poems. I just wasn't there yet. Um, it took a lot of processing. It took a lot of just kind of understanding the state of things in myself and in my own mind before I was able to put it into words. I used to, I was the happy poet. I wrote about mm -hmm. like love and friendship and kumbaya and all of that. And I still do. Um, but as of late, I've finally gotten a grip on being able to articulate how I feel about certain things and having enough information to feel a certain way about things. Because there was a certain point where I was like, I need to research this. I need to study this. I don't have enough information to be getting up on stage and saying these things. Like, I need to know within myself how I feel before I'm going to perform that in front of a room full of strangers. And so recently I've gotten um, frustrated enough and knowledgeable enough to where I, I do feel um, righteously indignant, we'll say, on, on mm -hmm. about certain things, and I'll, I've gotten a poem about gun violence, about police brutality, mm -hmm. um, about sexuality, um, and like, gender expression. Um, so yeah, taking the dive into that. All right, that's fantastic. So you said you had a piece about gun control? Uh, gun, yeah. Would you share that with us? I think it'd be a perfect segue to go into the conversation topic we're going through. Yeah, for sure. All right, cool. Yeah. After George Lee, an open letter from the bullet to the body. Not that it makes a difference at this point, but I wanted to be a fence or a roof. I wanted to protect people, maybe even a door knocker or a knob. I wanted to be able to let people in. I never wanted this from the body to the bullet. Not that it makes a difference at this point, but I wanted to be a teacher or a firefighter. I wanted to protect people. I never wanted this from the ground to the body. I remember you lighter than this. 
easy on your feet. You are so heavy now. I gave you to this world and knew one day I would get you back, but not like this. I never wanted this from the trigger finger to the trigger. Not that it makes a difference at this point, but I wanted to be the second half of a peace sign. Wanted advice from the pinky on how to make the right kind of promise, not this. I never wanted this. The shooter starts to say something, but the gun interrupts. Do you really think you get a voice here? You never had one before. I am your iron will. Don't you remember before me? You were nothing and no one listened, but now listen, our boom is echoing across the world they can hear you now gun says don't stop body says please stop but it won't and it hasn't and it seems like it never will when i wrote this poem there would have been more shootings than days this year thus far an open letter from the poet to the gun lobbyists and reps who lend their ears to their agenda not that it matters at this point but i don't want to keep needing to write this poem i don't want to keep being so heartbroken and infuriated and only be able to create derivative metaphors and trite personification to be able to deal with it our right to bear arms wasn't supposed to incite a war between between civilians, what? Are we your gladiators? Do you get pleasure from watching the bloodshed? Is this not Rome falling around us while you suck grapes in the rafters of this, your Colosseum? Are we entertainment to ease your insatiable taste for power? Fodder for your argumentative fire while iron fire falls on us in classrooms and movie theaters and festivals and concerts and Walmarts and malls and street corners and living rooms. A six-year-old died last week and it seems like you aren't doing much more than I am, sitting on your asses, whining, scribbling some piece of writing that in the end, won't actually do shit to change anything. Yeah. I, 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 I felt that in my soul, honestly. That was really powerful. Thank you. What um I'm now I'm curious. So when you wrote this when you wrote this poem, um, was there like what specific I mean, honestly there's um, countless shootings, yeah. right? So I don't even know, like, was there a specific one that triggered this? It was the for um, you? the shooting at the garlic festival. Like, it was just kind of the the drop that broke the dam. Like, mm -hmm. I had been avoiding writing this type of poem for a really long time. And then the week before this, I think, either the week before this or the week after this, I wrote a piece about police violence. And um, it was just a lot going on, not just in the world, but, like, in my life. And I needed to get it out. And we're doing this competition called The New Shit Showdown or the new Spitz showdown for the PG version, <laughs> um, where we have to write a new poem every week. And it was the only thing I could keep thinking of. Right. It was the only thing that I, like it's every time I put my pen to paper, every time I opened up my phone to type, it was the only thing that kept running in my mind. So I was like, okay, like, I need to write about that. It's like what your heart was feeling, yeah. where, you were, where you were at. That's really powerful. So you said the, are you talking about the festival in California? Or I which so. it yeah. was I, all I know is it was a garlic festival. I couldn't read too much of it. Mm -hmm. Like I got to a certain point and like my eyes were. Well, blurry. it's really tough, right? Yeah. Like at some point you're kind of like, when is enough enough? And yeah. I think it can be really emotional, and sometimes it's so draining that you just kind of have to take a break from it. So I feel that. Um, but I think that was the festival where the that was the the little boy. Yeah, right? it was the in six California. Year old. Yeah, there was a six year old that was killed. Um, I believe there was a grandfather's kills. Well, it's hard to not conflate all of these at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, right. But I do know that, yeah, that was the garlic festival. There were, I believe, four people killed. One was a six year old mm -hmm. kid. And yeah, it was in California. And that just like, that tore my heart open. Mm -hmm. And not like, not that everything else doesn't, but it was something about seeing a little boy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at a garlic festival. Mm -hmm. Right, like, where are you safe? Yeah, mm -hmm. you don't go to a festival and think I need to protect myself or because school. this might happen, yeah. right? Especially or places Walmart. like that, yeah. or a Walmart, right? Like the very next week, was it a week later? Yeah. A concert, indoor or outdoor. Yeah. All right. Well, it sounds like we're leading a little too much into our next conversation <laughs> topic. So why don't we say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank Diamond. you for sharing we appreciate that. Appreciate you us. coming thank out you here. No, no kidding. But you, Diamond. <laughs> that was seriously awesome. Like, yeah. I really, like, I felt emotional. I was like, am I about to cry? Me too. I, felt that little. Little. Yeah, <laughs> I saw you, girl. That's real. Okay, so uh, if you want to find me on social media, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, my Facebook is diamondmason.poetry, and my Instagram and my Twitter are O-H-M-X-M-A-S-O-N. Um, and so is my cash app for anybody interested in this. <laughs> hey. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> Show me the money. No <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Okay.
So our second guest today is going to be... Alexa. And Alexa, tell us what you're here to talk about today. Um, I am a high school student. I do some activism, mostly for gun control. So that's mostly what I'm here to talk about. Um, mostly just the point of view of a high school student and how we have been going through all these shootings and stuff and what we like, think about it. That's awesome. Okay, so obviously we are here to talk about gun violence. What would you say initially got you interested in that topic in general? Um, the Parkland kids were the ones to really drive us in. I think they are great um, idols for us just because I know that I didn't know a lot about it until they started speaking up and seeing people close to my age at least talk about it and be so confident and want to do something about it was what really brought me in say, hey, I could be doing more. Mm -hmm. um, they planned out the walkout and a lot of my friends wanted to do it. So I was part of the group of those kids at my school that actually helped plan out the walkout. So that's basically the first thing that I did gun control wise. Okay. And what are some of the other ways that you're kind of working to combat that issue or um, things that you see around you? I've been helping Moms Demand. I volunteer with that organization quite a bit. Um, they organized last year in 2018, We're Orange, and I helped document it. So I actually go to Communication Arts, so we know how to work like camera. So I actually helped record it and take photos and be able to get other students to edit a video just to capture that moment. And anytime they have like uh, postcards to sign to say like, hey, come out and vote or um, events like this with GET, I try my best to be there and help out and spread awareness. Since I can't vote yet, but I can speak out. <laughs> Funny you said that. Um, so you can't vote. How old are you? I am 17. Okay, so you're getting there. Uh, Close. I will be Almost. voting in 2020. Almost, yeah. yeah. Love to hear that. <laughs> so do you have any friends that are able to vote or kind of of age yet? Um, very few. Very few. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and do you ever hear any reasons as to why they won't vote or why they don't care about these issues at all? Yes. Um, I hear a lot that they don't know a lot about it, so they choose not to because they're not informed or something that I hear is that, oh, like, it's too much trouble. Mm -hmm. um, yes, the lines can be really long. It takes a long time out of your day. And that's something that I hear a lot is mm -hmm. um, taking the time out of your day to do that. It's something that, like, oh... I don't want to do that. It's too much work. Right. Yeah. So we want to hear from an even younger person, so like you, um, what are some of the ways that we can actually get those people out? How can we get them engaged? What are some of the ideas that you have? What do you think we can do? Um, I personally like having information available to me. So I really like how Twitter is being more open of a, like politics because that's how I, I get informed a lot. Um, I think having more information out there of like what's really going on, not really filtering it. Cause I know sometimes um, people can say like, oh no, nothing's going on. It's like an adult issue. Don't worry about it. Um, that's something that I wish wasn't told. Mm -hmm. If I was told more about what's happening and what's really on the news, I feel like they, it makes more of an impact when you hear the, the sort of things that are actually happening in the world to say, hey, I should get out there. <laughs> agreed, agreed. I think uh, Chad had, a good question. I, I, I well, I have two questions, and I think one of them's good, and one of them kind of sucks. <laughs> so I'm gonna let you guys figure out which one. Only want the good one. Okay. <laughs> well, you gotta decide which one's the good one. Um, so my, I guess my first question is what What's the goal? You know, as far as the activism goes, you know, what's what's the overall goal? Uh, well, like the big picture is decrease the mass shootings. So that's the goal. Well, sure. Um, <laughs> But right now, I know the Parkland kids, actually today we were just talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, they released a plan and a lot of it is just better regulations um, and strict regulations. Cause I know some, especially like Texas, um, will say they have laws for it, but they weren't, they won't hold up to what they say that they will do. Um, so there is laws, but they're not being enforced. And right. that's really what we want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that that's, that's definitely a fair start, and uh, so my my other question I think is a little bit more uh, it's a little bit more serious. So I I often joke about being on the older side of millennial because you know I am, <laughs> <laughs> but I I'm from Colorado originally, and I lived very close to Columbine and was in school when that happened. And when that when Columbine when that shooting happened, it was a one off. It was 
insane. The entire state was gripped with just fear and terror. And as a as a kid in school myself, I got as I, I it was I was part of that. I had to get the clear backpack and I got thrown out of school for wearing a trench coat and all this. And then it didn't happen again for a lot of years, right? So we have all this all this kind of space in between. Mm -hmm. But now you guys it, it seems like this happens almost like clockwork. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess my question is like what what the hell is it like being a kid in school right now? <laughs> right. Seriously, um, yeah. Something, uh, I actually talked about this in my world history class last year, no, two years ago. Um, my teacher was saying how when he was a kid, the thing was uh, nuclear bombs. Everyone was always having drills, uh, tuck and roll, <laughs> that sort of thing. And now it's the opposite with us, but now it's, uh, now it's not nuclear weapons. Now for us, it's shootings, <laughs> it's uh, drills, it's, um, it's scary. I know... It's scary, especially because there's like two sides of the argument completely. Like there's very few in between. So we had a drill at school not too long ago. Um, it was not a like drill. It, it was a lockdown. We had a lockdown because there was a, some someone was like being chased around the area. Um, so we had a lockdown, but nobody told us. It was just like go on lockdown. It was about when school was about to end, so we didn't know it was like. We knew it wasn't a drill because the bell was gonna ring like three minutes. It rang and we were still like sitting down. Mm -hmm. And I remember getting out and a lot of students were crying. It was um, people like the counselors walking around the house being like, "Are you okay? Uh, is everything fine?" And then on the other spectrum of sides, people were laughing wow. and being like, "Oh, whatever. Nothing's gonna happen. This is so dumb. Y'all are being weak for like crying or whatever." It's that's. Um, really the hard part is seeing people being so affected by it and others making fun of us for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah Do you feel like there is kind of a fear uh, of your day-to-day -day kind of going to school or just something that crosses your mind in general? Yeah, um, definitely something that like comes up a lot at school. Mm -hmm. um, it's silly, literally uh, about like 2018, a little bit after the walk up, people were like guessing like who would be the school shooter in our class. Right which is like so scary the fact that that would be something just to think about between our classmates to be like oh because when who would be it like we should be like because you really never know honestly so that's if that's a discussion that's happening in our classrooms i feel like there's something going there's a problem there's a, there's problem. a problem yeah yeah, yeah i shouldn't people in my class shouldn't be talking like oh who's this kid that's gonna shoot the school right. if that shouldn't be it right <laughs> That shouldn't be on our minds at all. Yeah, yeah no. it's something that's very realistic because mm -hmm. we see it. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious. Um, I know that with like the Barkland shooting and the students that really took leadership and mm -hmm. um, I've listened to them speak and it's so inspiring. Um, but I know a sentiment that I've um, that I heard from them is that like they really had to take ownership of like of their leadership because before I mean, it's true, like young people, even I'm not as young as you, but I'm in my 20s. And I feel as someone in my mid 20s, I don't get taken seriously enough because I'm young, mm -hmm. right? And so I wonder for you, um, did you feel that way or do you feel that way now? And did the Parkland um, high school students that really owned um, that movement and their leadership, uh, did they inspire that? And did they kind of show you like, hey, you know what? Maybe adults aren't taking me seriously, but it doesn't matter because you have a mind of your own. Like what was, I guess I'm wondering, where were you, where are you now? How did the Parkland shooting and the leaders that run that movement and are um, a part of that movement impact you? Yeah, um, definitely before the Parkland survivors like spoke up about the issue, I was not really into activism. I thought, oh, I'm too young, or like it's not an issue of mine. I'm, I mean, I can't vote it. I shouldn't be doing any of this. Um, like, sure, I had an opinion and stuff, but I never acted on it. Um, so they were really the ones to show us we should be speaking about it if adults aren't. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's when I really started to do activism, as I said. Um, now I feel better about like what I say it's still hard I think I think that's one of the major issues with like my generation right now is that we do activism like much for our lives and mm -hmm. then 
nothing seems to change, so we mm-hmm. don't feel as motivated anymore. Right. That's really where we are right now, I think. It's really hard to keep going. I know that volunteering right now, not as many events as I saw in 2018 are happening anymore. I don't see as many marches. Mm-hmm. Um, the marches that I have gone to, it's like me and like 10 other people. Mm-hmm. It's not It's not as big as when the Parkland kids really like started talking about it mm-hmm. because we didn't see any change. Um, but right. it's, yeah, I think that's something that we have to keep in mind that change takes time. Right, it does. And so I guess... It's, it's really disappointing and it's sad because we're constantly talking about how we need more young people. Mm-hmm. We need more um, that young energy so being a part of this power. movement, right? And then we get them and and I totally understand feeling kind of deflated and like, look at all this work that we're doing and nothing's happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so what can we do? What do, what do, you, what do you think um, as the adults, the older adults, like, what can we do to support you all as young people, mm-hmm. as like our leaders now and our future leaders to keep that momentum going and to for you all to feel supported? Because I think like that's the toughest thing is you don't feel supported. How can you want to continue this fight? But what can we do, you feel? Um, I think asking and starting conversation would be one that I think is really important. Um, Stuff like this, like being asked to come here, is mm-hmm. it feels a lot better to have um, to know that someone is like hearing you, like in your opinion, mm-hmm. and knowing what you're thinking about. So yeah, starting conversations. I know in school people are like, I don't want to get too political. Like teachers say that, but mm-hmm. everything is politics. Yes. Girl. So yes. Girl. Thank you. Someone had to say it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, starting conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's and bringing y'all into it, right? Yes. Like, okay. Hearing us out. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Noted. Hey, earlier you <laughs> said, I just had one question kind of, so earlier you said that you go to these marches and there's only like 10 people. Well, I was wondering, when you get out there and you've done all this work to get out there and there's only 10 of you, what makes you continue to advocate even though the response isn't perhaps what you would hope? Um, for me personally, it's that I've had many really good role models um, in school tell me about or like history that I have to keep going because mm-hmm. like not, it's not going to be one march and it's going to change. That's not how it works. It's like to keep going, keep getting the word out, keep eventually to where you get most of your circle, most of your community to go out and like vote and be able to be part of your community and have an impact like that. So that's mostly it for me. For me, it's being able to have people in my life uh, that tell me to keep going and help me um, know that my opinion and the marches are not going in vain. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So to kind of wrap it up, I want you to tell us when you can, why you're going to vote. Okay. I'm going to vote. So... I know that the people in charge are actually believing what I believe mm-hmm. and are people that I trust, so I feel safer, are people that I know will enforce the laws that I believe in. Um, that's why I'm going to vote. Yes. Love that. Yeah. Thank love you that. so much. Is there anywhere we can find you, Miss um, Alexa? Yeah. You can we find can me you. on Instagram okay. and Alexa Create. I actually do some photography and cello. So Beautiful. Yeah. Nice. That's a lot of the stuff that I do. Music. <laughs> yeah. Hey, okay. Awesome. Okay. Well, we have a young leader on our hands, so <laughs> thank you so much for coming here. We will definitely be on the lookout for you, so thank you, Miss Alexa. <laughs> thank and we'll you so definitely much. keep you in mind for future things. Oh, yeah. Bring your voice to the table. It's oh, really yeah. important. Yeah. I'd love mm-hmm. to be you. here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alexa. Thanks, Alexa. I know. You know, okay, so for me, as many of you uh, may know at this point, because I've talked about my job as a teacher, mm-hmm. um, I'm like, it's crazy to me. So I just started work uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, and we had our trainings, and we had our training with our police officers, school district police officers about like emergencies and how to handle the situations. And the biggest part of our training was what to do during if a active shooter was on campus. Uh, And it was crazy to me because I'm like, I'm literally sitting there and I'm thinking, this is our reality Mm -hmm. where they're spending this large amount of time on this because it's that serious and that real. And yet we're doing nothing about it. In fact, in Texas, 
we're making it easier for people to get guns. And that's what's just, it blows my mind. Um, but I literally, they showed us this video uh, of, um, it was actors and they were portraying a active shooter on campus students and what they were doing and what teachers did well, what teachers didn't do well. Um, and it honestly, it was, it was a bit gory. And I remember looking around the room and there were tears in teachers' eyes. Tears. Tears don't fall down people's faces when something like that isn't real, mm -hmm. when something like that is just pretend mm -hmm. and unrealistic. Tears are rolling down our eyes because we know as a teacher, if my kids were in danger, I would put my life on the line and I would not think twice. But it's crazy because that, that's literally on our minds, right. you know? And I, um, the crazier thing about that is that it's on our kids' minds okay. too. Um, I know like one time some of my kids have asked me, they're like, Mr. Salas, so would you, would you protect us if like a shooter came? Would, you know, you would stand in a gun? You would stand in front of a gun? I'm like, of course I would. Mm -hmm. But I hate that I, I have to convince my kids right. that they don't have to worry about that. What grade do you teach? I feel like it's important for them to understand. I teach first kids. grade. Oh, shit. Exactly. That's rough. Please don't break my word. This is where the living's going on. So please, 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 please don't break my word. This is the Get It Podcast where we get it every single damn day. Thank you so much for listening. We will listen to you next time.